FIO have improved their popular FH5 hybrid in-ear monitors with the FH5S. Let's check them out. So getting started with the FH5S, well this case probably looks familiar if you've seen my FD5 review because this is the FD5 case and well it's pretty much identical. So nice original design case which I appreciate and uh, inside you have, well I've just roughly dropped them in there so you can see how they sit. They have little pockets which velcro on, you can kind of rearrange that as you please for the in monitors to sit in and they come with, well a MMCX removal tool, which isn't as good as the FD5 one. The FD5 one came with, and I've got another one sitting around on my desk here, the cool MMCX removal tool from Final, which was much better, which just gives even pressure on both sides and will pop out even really stubborn connectors, whereas the metal one isn't quite as good. So that's the only kind of thing. I wish they'd included the, the better tool, but who knows why they couldn't do that. But one thing that's changed compared to the original FH5s, which I've got sitting here, it's kind of pretty obvious once I put them out on the table, is the cable has changed. So this dark grey cable, which was kind of chunky and not quite as flexible, it has now been replaced with this slightly more kind of, what we could say, audiophile looking cable, which is braided. It's slightly different from the FD5 one, which I'll show you, bring out in a bit. But it certainly looks the part. I've got the nice, you know, classy looking choker here. I mean, it really does look you know, kind of high-end, I suppose. And I think it's silver-plated copper of some description. Also, the um, the FH5 originals, you have this very chunky kind of memory memory thing here with this. And they have a slightly lighter one, kind of more like Campfire Audio does, on the uh, FH5S cable. And you can adjust this. You just, you know, hold it out to the position you want and then put it under a hairdryer for five seconds. It'll readjust and just cool it down. And I haven't done that. I find it curled a little bit too much for me, but all the same. Actually, the, the cool thing about the cable, though, is that they have these removable plugs, which you have on the FD5 as well. And they just unscrew and, and pull out. So if you want to change to, say, a 3.5, which I do often, you can just grab that thus, and it's keyed. You just have to wind it up with a notch inside, as so, and then give it a good push, and then it just screws on. And also has a 25 millimeter connector as well. Now it's different from the LCRE cable which uses the right angle plugs which is slightly different. It's not compatible with that. So the LCRE cable is still maybe a touch better in that regard because these end plugs end up being, removable plugs end up being a little bit long for preference. You know, it's going to stick out of the player a little bit. But all the same, still a nice cable. Now the actual IEMs themselves don't look radically different to the original FH5s. Apart from looking black, they look a bit more like the FH7 actually, being black with a gold trim, goldish, it looks like uh, like a rose goldish kind of trim. So a similar kind of shape. You can see that the shape has changed a little bit, but otherwise you've still got, but you've got it actually a little bit bigger, if anything, in the body. So you've got a couple of dynamic drivers in there in this case, and, but otherwise that kind of, kind of organic shape designed to fit ears. Now what's changed on the nozzle aspect of things, I've just got a pair of spin fits on here, is the nozzle on the FH5s, and I've removed the grill, remember if you saw my review of that, to improve the sound, these were kind of hard to slip some of the tips on, but with the FH5S, I'll try not to get them all entangled, which I already have, is the nozzle is a little bit kind of smoother, it's about the same size, but it's got, it hasn't got a, quite as big a notch, and it seems to get tips on there a little bit easier than it did the FH5 does, so it doesn't have quite a notch to push over, and well, it just it just seemed to work better. Seems to be easier to put tips on, so the notch isn't quite as good, as big, which is something I'm very happy about. So, for example, the standard tips still have this a slightly narrow bore, and pushing it onto something like the FH5s was kind of tedious, but it isn't too bad on the FH5s. You do have to still give a bit of a a twist, but it gets on fine. Now they don't sit as deep, well I mean they, but neither, of them, neither of these in-ear monitors because of the design sit, sat particularly deep in the ear, you know they kind of stick, you haven't got a lot of nozzle to stick out there to sit in. So you see like what happened with Campfire is they, they made them push the nozzle out on some of their in-ear monitors so they had a bigger shoulder 
so you could get a bit deeper insert. You can't get quite a deep insert with this because once you get these on, unless you just sit them just on there and leave a deep and leave a, a large chamber in there, if you push them all the way down, you end up with a shallow chamber and a less of a deep insert. So something you may want to play with because that can change the sound slightly. But the significant thing about these is that you can change the sound. I mean, not just in sw switching tips, but you have these three switches. And which way up are we? They're very small, so it's, I've got to work out which way up we're going. And these three tiny switches, and the, the cleaning tool comes with a, a tip that, that designed to switch these. Uh, instead of the, the weird arrangement on the FA9s, which kind of had a weird description, these just simply adjust the bass, mids, and treble. And pushing up one of the switches as required. So for example, you can see the bass switch is up there, so the bass boost is on. And I like them with the bass and mid boost pushed up, which I've done there. I just use a pair of tweezers because I don't have the removal tool handy. But this allows a little bit of tuning, which is a good chance to talk about the sound, actually. So I'm going to get one thing out of the way kind of in reverse. I normally do comparison second, but one thing is that I listen with the FH5s, actually, with, an, with again, with the grill removed, against the FH5S, and it's like, Immediately like, okay, gone. The improvement is just so dramatic for the FH5S. So, I mean, in comparison, the FH5s sound muddy. Now, the thing I liked about the FH5s, and a lot of people did, is they kind of had a W-shaped sound signature. And you're thinking, what the heck is W-shaped sound signature? Okay, so bad description with hands. Flat. Okay, now nothing's every you can't be perfectly flat with it, with uh, everyone's ears being different. Now, one of the common signatures you get with some things like, say, Campfire Audio's Atlas and some other stuff is a V shape. So it means bass boost and treble boost and mids pushed back. Now the thing is with the typical V shape is the mid bass, which is where you where we hear most bass, not the deep bass, is still pushed fairly forward, so you get a kind of thick sound and you get usually a bright sharp treble. Now with that. That's kind of can make sound music sound a little bit congested. Now sometimes the uh, you get what's called a U-shaped sound. So I have to do the different analogy here. U-shape will be, well, kind of not V, but a little bit more U-shaped. So a letter U. So it means the low bass is boosted, and there's a bit there's a treble peak somewhere, which you kind of need. Otherwise, everything sounds really dull. And that means that the mid bass isn't too thick sounding, but you get a kind of open, clear sound. The mids are pushed back a bit, but you know, not too much, depending on the on the setup. And that's what that can work really, really well with some EDM monitors. The FH5s had a W shape where the mids have a bit forward as well, so you have a bit of a peak somewhere in the mids. And you can see this. Go to Crinical.com and look at his graphs. He has this as a graph of it, and you can see it. It's kind of not as you as shapely as my fingers are, but you get the idea. It means that when you have music which has vocals or instruments, which are kind of, you know, sit around the mid-range, they're not so pushed back that they're not, like, the emphasis of them is not lost. And they're not so, you don't have the thick mid-bass that makes them, you know, kind of takes away from them. So they still sound open, but they still sound quite clear. Now, it kind of was a mixed thing with the FH5. Some people didn't like the slight mid-forward, but I thought it was a clever way of tuning them. So when you, got, when you wanted bass rumble, or when you needed bass rumble, you got it, but you didn't have this overwhelming bass, and you still had a very good mid-range. Now imagine that, but it jumped the clarity up considerably, and you've got the FH5S. And now, when you set these off to start with, the sound is kind of fairly, and I'm going to say you know, relatively because I haven't measured them, flat. And so that, that, thump, that low thumping bass isn't quite so there. I mean, everything just sounds really, really super open. So what I did is, first thing I did is flick up the bass switch on both of these in-ear monitors, and that gave me that low bass rumble like I had with the FH5s, but still that great clarity. Now, it doesn't have that thick mid-bass, which, some, as I said, some in-ear monitors have, which was good. So I got that low bass rumble, very nice. And then I thought, well, let's try pushing up the mid one some more uh, to see if I get that same kind of effect as the FH5 originally had. And I did, and it doesn't push the mid-range so far forward that it becomes irritating. It just does it just about right. So for the rest of this review, I'm going to stick with description using these two switches on, but not the treble one. And the reason is, Fio doesn't do brilliant treble, and that's kind of their only failing, really. I mean, what, you think of the FH7s, which had an incredibly clever bass uh, system, and that system 
allowed it, even whatever your tips you did whatever tips you changed or whatever the base stayed consistently good and that's the problem with and I'm going to talk about another thing which I own, I'm going to say I only used the standard tips the standard uh, balance tips as they're called here's the tip selection it's fairly typical of what Fio has I mean the FD5 ones which I have here obviously labeled so I don't get confused are you know much the same except there were because the FD5 has the option of a narrower bore which it has slightly different uh, biflange tips, but otherwise it still has tips labeled bass, vocals, etc. But it because each of the in-ear monitors from Fio is slightly different, these don't have the same effect on all, all of their monitors, which is kind of weird. I think they just kind of dropped them in there. Now the reason I used the standard ones is they have a kind of narrowish bore compared to the all the others, and that brought out the bass really well. Switching to any of the others, you just knocked out that bass, regardless of what the switches were set at. So in the end, I thought I think these are great when you play to their strengths, which is the bass. Now talking about the treble, the like the other Fio in-ear monitors, the drivers for the treble are in the tip, right up, right up in the tip. So that that's not the the best way to get the best refinement out of a pair of in-ear monitors. Now I haven't yanked the grills out of this to see if the sound quality improves. Maybe it will. That was a trick with the FH5s. You could pull that out, but you risk getting like earwax in there and, and jamming up the the drivers. That's the kind of risk you have in doing that. But it might improve the treble a bit. Now, as such, when you in a typical balanced hybrid or or usually a dynamic driver design, when you restrict the output, you increase the bass. So that slight restriction you get with these tips increase helps the bass boost itself. And there's also obviously a part of the design is the semi-open design on the back, which is probably helping things sound a little bit open as well. I don't know how open they are. I'm not going to be able to take these on public transport at the moment. We're in the state of emergency and where I am in, in Japan, and I'm not particularly willing to go out and test these. So I might try some putting some uh, plain noise in the in on some on my speakers at some point and see if I can compare if the the isolation is affected. But generally these sounded more open and clear but with still with that great bass performance although I had to keep these tips on to get it everything else literally just killed the bass everything else was everything else except the balance tips was wide bore and regardless of what they were labeled as it just killed the bass so in the end I just stuck to this and with the, the, those two switches on so I basically duplicated the setup of the FH5s but with a more open and clear sound so probably let me talk about the music one of the tracks I've been testing with recently is Hey Now by London Grammar. It's a good balance of kind of pop music, uh, but also the recording quality is really good. And there's not a good degree of bass thump. There's good quality vocals. So I kind of found it, uh, you know, nice for testing these. Now, one of the, the things that's, you know, immediately impressive when you listen with the FH5S is they sound very open and airy. Now, I plugged this into good old uh, Hybe's R6 2020 version which I've reviewed before if I remember I'll chuck a card up in the corner you can check that out as well and I thought you know kind of good mid high end range DAP would be probably do the job and it did and uh, the nice thing about this is that the bass it gives that nice low bass thump but it doesn't intrude on the mids even though it comes through strongly of course with the, the bass switch up and these you know narrow bore standard tips it was it was really enjoyable to have that the mids sound very clear yet that good bass that thump thump coming through and that open sound is what was really remarkable with these now the mids were of course with again with that that switch the mid switch up were nice and forward but not too forward to become kind of overblown so they didn't have that it still didn't have that kind of upper mid presence which can sometimes be too much and make sound make the sound kind of a little bit wonky now one of the next tracks I used was Burn the Witch by Radiohead, which is a track I really liked really recently. And of course it has some orchestral background in there. It's not the best orchestral recording out there, but still, it has a lot going on and you can kind of make out, you know, there's a difference between higher end stuff and lower end stuff with this. And only in a couple of passages did I find things a little bit too congested. I mean, it's probably some of that is the music itself. But otherwise it kind of sounded nice and fairly open and clear. The thing with, you know, when you start to get into instruments like cymbals and violins and stuff like that, especially cymbals with these, is that you notice that the limitations of the treble of the Fio in-ear monitors. And that is that the, you know, when you get a cymbal hit, and on high-end stuff you get a long decay. You can really hear the decay of the note, you know, maybe even in the really high-end stuff here, echoing off the walls of the studio kind of thing. The cymbal decay was kind of very, like, hits the cymbal and finish. So that's it. 
and so the, the decay was very short. So the, the treble quality kind of wasn't that resolving. And that's when you kind of notice, oh, okay, maybe these aren't the most resolving in-ear monitors. Still very open and clear sounding, but, you know, the the ultra, you know, the, the resolution you get with $1,000 plus in-ear monitors, or at least good ones, just wasn't there. And the treble is still a little bit kind of, maybe a little, a touch harsh. So a little bit aggressive and harsh in some respects. And that's where I kind of went from, okay, let's try something else. Let's try a different player, not just the the kind of very, uh, you know, the ES-based R6 2020, but let's try something a little bit kind of smoother. And so I found the N3 Pro, which I've also reviewed, and if I remember, I'll check a card up in the corner too. Now this, of course, has a tube mode optionally. You can't see the tube glowing now because you have to have headphones plugged in and playing back, but it has two tube modes. It has a triode and ultralinear, and the triode mode sounds a little bit softer, and the ultralinear ultra linear mode a little bit kind of more aggressive and there's also solid state mode and with that it kind of softened up the aggressiveness of these of the FH5S and I do find the uh, you know FIO IMs to be a little bit aggressive probably some of that is the again the the not the most refined treble probably gives you that kind of impression but there was kind of no overall harshness to kind of really be irritating it was just kind of very lively and kind of entertaining sound and I think a lot of people really like that. I mean, in the when you get into the high-end stuff, you, that, that subtle nuances and the refinement can become very, very good, especially with acoustic music, which I'll talk about in a bit. But taking maybe, so maybe some people want to take the edge off that, and I felt it was a really nice match with Cayenne's N3 Pro because it does take that edge off within the tube mode. It makes it sound a little bit more euphonic. And I didn't feel like I was losing anything particularly, except maybe the, the uh, R6 sounded kind of more dynamic. There was more punch in the bass more of that, whereas the out of the N3 Pro, you got more of a kind of open, relaxed, kind of tubey, slightly tubey sound, and it was kind of more pleasant and soft. And with say with acoustic music, I kind of liked it, the N3 Pro. When I wanted a bit more punch and a bit more aggression, I really liked the R6. And there was also actually one of the amps I did try was with the Q3, which is Fio's own Q3, the THX based amp. And this actually was a nice match. It's not, of course, the most resolving. It tends to be a little bit soft in how it, in, in how it's in the sound that comes out. So the bass isn't quite as sharp. Everything isn't quite as sharp. But it's kind of soft and a little bit relaxing. And I felt that was a nice match with the FH5S. So in that regard, you know, a little bit softening things up a little bit actually worked well. But in terms of scaling up, I wouldn't go past anything around this price range. I mean, the kind of $500 DAPs is kind of where you want to go with these. I mean, I did try with the N6 Mark II, which is, you know, over $1,000, you know, about 1400 or so, depending on setup and what you buy. And maybe you've got maybe a tiny little bit better, more precision in the base, but no, you're not scaling up. This is kind of over, overkill, definitely, for the FH5S. So kind of around this price range is about the limit you want to take it in terms of scaling. So while they did sound kind of open and clear, they didn't scale up to the kind of you know, the, the high-end stuff. Now, the interesting is to go for some modern music, and you already may have noticed I've been listening to Spoon. Knock, 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 one of the tracks I've been listening to. Now, it's a bit sibilant, you know, it's one of those modern tracks that's kind of a little bit harsh in the highs, and it wasn't unbearably so out of the FH5S. I mean, it's great. Again, not the most refined treble, but still aggressive, but not overdone. I mean, it was that kind of really dynamic, you know, kind of uh, entertaining sound I really liked out of these. But the punchiness of the brace was really great, and that's what Fio seems to do really well. And again, you get more kick out of this than you do out of, say, the uh, N3 Pro. On to that, I've got a couple more tracks. One is called The Hop, and I'll just put it up on screen because I'm going to mispronounce everyone, all the, the, uh, the name of the singer and everything like that, who is really cool, this, uh, this uh, foreign singer. Really awesome. I actually found discovered her originally when uh, listening to Bonobo, which uh, my followers will know because a really great track I found from Bonobo with um, this lady on it. And oh my god, the bass rumble is just great. It you know again strong bass but not in your face. And you know the vocals are still back a bit even with the vocal switch forward, but still I mean it was more kind of a sense of spaciousness than kind of you know sounding like it was V shaped or anything. Now, versus the FD5, you're probably wondering about. So, the FD5s, if you recall, are really, you know, a single dynamic driver. And so I thought there's a good chance to compare them. Now, the setup I have at the moment is kind of bass-oriented as well. And to kind of lower the treble, 
I prefer the narrower bores on them. Now remember, if you remember, they had two different bores you could screw in, wider or narrower. I prefer narrower. I prefer them with a slightly darker sound signature, and they're only barely falling sitting on here, but these type E tips. And so, I mean, this is the kind of setup I take out and listen to, listen with if I'm out and about, because if you have something that's too bright in the treble, it kind of intermodulates with all the sound leaking in, and it kind of sounds more harsh than would be ideal. So I listen to this track, the hop out of both, and... With the FD5s, and again with this setup, you know the the bass you get more mid bass, so you get that thicker kind of V-shaped sound, and you know a bit more boomy, a bit more congested, so a bit more kind of closed in than the more open sound with the FH5S, and but still you still have the you know the the brighter sound you get you notice the the lack of refinement in the treble more so with this setup that I have even with you know trying to keep it as dark as possible. Now, I'll quickly talk about some jazz. I was listening to a Japanese artist called Yoko Mabuchi. She does covers of her own jazz and some covers of other stuff. And with the FD5, you know, it made for easy listening to jazz. Though there's not much kind of, you know, sometimes I wish for a little bit more air with jazz music, so I might change the tips or something like that to a wider bore tip and kind of reduce the bass a bit and have a more balanced sound. But with the FH5S, they shine better with that track, you know, more spacious sounding, more open... The only thing, of course, again, with that treble, the nuances in the sound, you know, like with cymbal hits, were missing. You know, the cymbals just went boom and that's it. There was no, there wasn't that long decay you get with high-end stuff. So this ended up being a better setup, even tuned as, to be as bassy kind of as possible. Now, that kind of made me think in the end, what I wish, and this is a thing I wished with some other in-ear monitors as well, I wish I could have the tuning I've set up here with the bass and mid-switch on, but with a wider bore in-ear wider bore tips and if I had that then people who want to go dark like I did with the FD5s could go the standard bore tips and then go make it darker sounding for people who like that kind of thing and the people who want to open and clear sound could go with the wider bore tips and the thing is you know to get it doesn't end up sounding very dark you just get that strong bass rumble that you can get out of these in-ear monitors but you can't get it darker sounding so there is some tuning available I and mean, if you're going between flat kind of flattish you know, with not much bass and maybe a bit and some more bass and maybe more mids, that will suit you. And I never pushed the, the treble up because, you know, as I said, it ends up being, you know, the treble isn't the cleanest treble that you get out of any monitors. So I like that balance that I had there. So I wish they could have, I wouldn't, I wish I didn't have to stick to these tips because if I could have stuck to, say, wide bore tips to start with, I could have tried using spiral dots and stuff like that. But with those on, it just, you know, there's, the bass is just knocked out to a large degree. So in the end, I think FIO definitely did a big improvement to the FH5s. You know, they've improved everything generally. You have the switchable plugs, you have the the um, the nicer cable, it's slightly different from the FD5 cable, but you have generally everything. Maybe the fit was a, is is uh, maybe not much different, but overall a, a big jump up for the what is it about two two hundred and fifty nine dollars that I recall they cost. But still, you know, there's kind of the weirdness, like why do they just use the same tips when they don't have the same effect and they're etc, etc. That was a kind of a little bit odd, but um, otherwise still, you know, they've now upped the game for the $259, and I'm sorry I don't have a huge variety of in monitors to compare with at that kind of price, as some other people have. But what I'll do later is I'll do some more comparisons to things like the FH7s and others when I um, and shoot another video. So thanks very much for that, and thanks to everyone who supported these videos. If you do want to see my impressions of stuff that I've got in for review when I get it in for review and not later, like you have to, you don't have to wait for the videos, you want my buying advice and to help you buy the right stuff straight up, then consider becoming a supporter and, and help me make these videos and I'd like to help you out buy the right gear for you. So as always, links are on screen and thanks once again for watching and I look forward to seeing you on my Patreon and, and Discord.